Hi everyone <laughs> and welcome to our final health talk, Inequalities in Medicine. I am Namoya Maziamba, I'm a biomedical sciences student and I'm studying at Queen Mary University. And I'm Zarina Mornekoa and I'm studying pharmacology and innovative therapeutics also at Queen Mary. And we have our social media up on the screen. If you want to add us on either Instagram or LinkedIn, it's just there for you. And we'll display the screen at the end as well. Inequalities in medicine. Yeah, so our <laughs> talk today is inequalities in medicine. We'll be talking about um, why there is inequalities in medicine and much, much more. So of course, as you guys know, anyone who's been here before, we start with a mini quiz. So the first question, has medical practice achieved complete balance and fairness in treatment of patients? What do you guys think? It's yes or no. So you can just shout out whether you think yes or you think no. 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 We've got one no. Does anyone think it has achieved balance and fairness? No. It's so another no. So yeah, we no. uh, from our answer it's no, and we have got facts as you're going to see in the rest of our slides to back up why our answer is no. Second question: What are the three key factors that cause inequality in medicine? Anyone can shout any, any factors or any demographics you might fall into um, that might cause inequality in your medical um, treatment, treatment or in your, your postcode. Your postcode, okay, so your yeah. area. Where you live, yeah. Culture and religion. Yeah. Any others? We haven't got the three that we've got here, but these are all other factors as well. Any other guesses? I, think, yeah. I was gonna guess. Um, oh, I was gonna guess to like uh, not. Pardon? I was gonna say a north and south divide. Like basically, wow. the north. <laughs> yeah. You've literally yeah. hit the nail on the head with one of our factors that we're gonna talk about. But yeah, any other yeah. any other factors anyone wants to say? How poor or rich you are. Yes, so that's definitely one, socioeconomic status. That's in fact one the of the three. <laughs> um, and the other two, does anyone have any more clues, guesses, anything that they think might cause inequality? Racial background? Uh -huh. Race, exactly. And I think the last one we've said already, but oh, we hadn't, but also gender. And the third question is, what is the poorest part of England, England, the North or the South? So I know that Helen mentioned it, but do we know which side is the poorest on average? North. Mm -hmm. It yeah. is the North. And we'll delve more into how this actually affects medicine later on. So we have inequality versus inequity. Inequality is the unequal distribution of some phenomenon. Some are biological, for example, between males and females, only biological females can bear a child and males can't. This is it technically inequality, it's unequal distribution of some phenomenon. However, what we're going to be delving into today are the systemic, is the systemic unfairness, which is inequity, which is when it's not just biological, it's not something we can't change, it's actually a system that has been imposed on us through various means, but it is the inequity of things. We'll be using the phrases uh, interchangeably, but inequity is the core of what we're speaking about today. So that's inequity, but we are gonna include some inequality as well. So the first one, socioeconomic status. So this is open to you guys. How does this impact medical practice and accessibility? And has it impacted you? So the first question, 
How do you think socioeconomic status can impact medical practice or accessibility? So people that have more money um, or they're, that are in a better financial um, situation, you know, they have quicker access to certain, like they have private healthcare that is often um, much better, quicker, um, and a quicker service. Yeah, yeah, that's that's one thing for sure. Um, ha has anyone been affected by how their socioeconomic status has um, affected them? Obviously, if you don't want to share, that's okay, because this is recorded. But if anyone does want to share, this can be a time. No, <laughs> that's okay. So the next slide is just going delving into socioeconomic status. So I wanted to include a video for us to understand the social disparity, especially in the UK. So we're just gonna go from a, a small amount of this video. I would encourage you guys to watch this video in its entirety. Should we care about inequality? But we're Conclusions are here. the same. To make things simple, let's imagine the population of the UK as a group of 100 people, each person representing 1% of UK households. Some of these people might live alone, others as a couple, some might have children, others might be teachers, nurses, footballers, plumbers, accountants, even celebrities. Now let's line these people up from the poorest to the richest. Let's colour code the bottom fifth, the top fifth and those in the middle. And let's take the total household income of the UK, that's around £900 billion, and imagine it's £1,000 coins. We can now show roughly how the UK's income is shared. This is what a perfectly equal society would look like. The person at the top earns the same as the person at the bottom. Each person has £10 coins. Most would agree, though, that inequality is a fact of life if people are to be rewarded for their work and ability. So what does the UK actually look like? Based on the latest data for the year 2012, once taxes have been paid, benefits added and adjustments made for whether people live alone or part of a family, this is how income is divided. This is the actual inequality of household income in the UK. The poorest person doesn't even receive half a coin, not even 50 pence. The bottom 18 people, the lowest 18% of households, have less than five pounds. The person in the middle, the 50th person, has eight coins. The person three quarters the way along, the 75th person, has 11 and a half coins. And the person at the top receives almost 80 pounds. In other words, even after tax, the household at the top takes home around 150 times more than the poorest household and 50 times more than the second poorest. But if... Yeah, and I would encourage you to watch this uh, YouTube video if you want to know more about in inequality in the UK. But I just wanted to drive that there is inequality, as we all know, but just for you to see it visually, how it um, affects the UK specifically. But we have the NHS, you might say, which is, for anyone who is not from the UK or doesn't, isn't familiar with the system, it's a national health uh, Service. service. <laughs> Thank you. A national health service which is run by the government and paid for by taxes. What this means is that we don't have to pay many of our upfront health costs, apart from dentistry um, and or nuanced treatments, but overall our treatment will be covered by the government. However, we still see here on this graph, which, is, which I took from the Marmot study, um, we still see that life expectancy and disability-free life expectancy has inequality. So here we can see the trend goes from the most deprived with the lowest life expectancy to the least deprived on the right with the highest life expectancy and life expectancy is written here on the left. Here these two lines represent the North and the South. As you can see, the North's life expectancy although it does increase, is much lower than the South. And this is because in the South, we have more doctors per thousand, group of, a thousand people 
Uh, we also have more money pumped into our health services here than in the north, and we have more money overall flowing around here. We also have uh, richer people here. In terms of who would be the most deprived, it's going to be more of those in the north. I mean, in the yeah, in the north than in the south, and this would affect your life expectancy. Here we can see people living in the poorest neighborhoods in England will on average die seven years earlier than the people living in the richest neighborhoods. It's not something that we'd want to hear, but it unfortunately is a fact in today's, in today. So the North-South divide, I know that Helen spoke about this before. A case study on how the low socioeconomic status leads to inequality in healthcare. People in the north of England are 20% more likely to die before they reach 75 than those in the south. We are privileged in the UK to have the NHS, but here um, research in the British Medical Journal, which has been peer reviewed, so it's quite reliable, we would say, um, they set their dividing line between the north and the south by splitting it into nine government regions of England. The five northernmost were the Northeast, the Northwest, Yorkshire and Humber, East Midlands and West Midlands. And the four southernmost being East, London, Southeast and Southwest. Each area's population is about 25 million. A statistical model was used to calculate the differences in mortality between the North and the South of England after taking into account differences in the age and the sex of the two populations, the percentages of excess deaths in the north were then calculated as incident rate ratios. And the re researchers defined the north has excess mortality. So I just read that out to make sure that we understand that even with um, compromises being taken in terms of making sure that they balance out the differences in ages, the differences in sexes, there was still a north-south divide in healthcare, which is not what you want considering that we are meant to be a very developed nation. And what about mental health? Wealth and mental health, well, the worst, the worst of fifth of children are four times more likely to have a severe mental health condition than the best of. We know already that mental health is paramount in order to have, good mental health is paramount in order to have good physical health. We can see that um, from a study that I took, meant in terms of mental health, poor, poor people are four times more likely to be in debt, where poor people are three times more likely to be the victims of burglary and many more things which would indicate, which are indications that we can take on mental health being anxious, not being, not feeling safe, not feeling financially stable are all things that can affect mental health. And in the course I did on mental health, it shows that traumatic events that are caused by um, being in debt or having abusive relationships are triggers that um, affect our mental health and lead us to um, a decline in our mental health. So these things do have a huge impact on your mental health. And when you have those conditions or when you're um, developing them, you're less likely to look after your physical health because you're so um, sad or anxious or um, you're not in the right mind basically to look after yourself. So there is a strong correlation. There is tons of research that have already proven that looking after your mental health is looking after your physical health. They exactly. are linked and they are one. Exactly. And we're not saying here that being rich or money equals happiness. It doesn't. However, studies have been done that say up to a certain level, mental well-being and wealth do they do go up to a certain level. This is because if you're worrying about where you're going to eat, what you're going to eat, where you're going to sleep, you can't you you literally just don't have the time or the mental capacity to look after your well-being. And these are things which all, as we know, indi are indications of health. So we have the second uh, indication or the second factor that can be involved with your health. I wanted to include this video as, um, I guess, evidence, case-based evidence on these women here to see how medicine and the inequalities in medicine affected them specifically. 
they are going to be talking about Cedars Sinai, which is a medical facility which has had better improvements in this, but I'd like you to take away their stories and what they say. Three years, almost a year. Seven years. Eight months. I went 16 years before I was properly diagnosed. I went 10 years in pain before I was diagnosed. The first symptom was a sharp stabbing pain between my shoulder blades that felt like a ice pick. My abdomen was just getting bigger and bigger and it was hard. My skin turned yellow, my eyes turned yellow. I almost felt this feral level of fear because I'd never experienced a pain so mysterious and profound like this. With every step I took, I was just at level nine pain. My chest was hurting, my, I'm sweating, my jaw was killing me. The pain, the cramps, uh, having to run to the bathroom all the time. Oh, I was so discouraged. My symptoms just kept getting worse. I'm not eating anymore. Um, you know, I can't sleep anymore. I was told that I was a female who was looking for attention and that they see no sign of anything else wrong with me except for maybe it was in my head. I was told that I was crazy. Sometimes I was told I was lazy. Sometimes I was told I was unmotivated. Being told there was nothing wrong with me, that I was just gonna have to get used to my ever expanding belly, that I had IBS and I was just obese. I was told that I was experiencing psychosomatic pain stemming from guilt for sinning with boys. So he said, you know, maybe this is just anxiety. I think you're just having anxiety and, you know, you probably need to see a psychiatrist. I came to Cedar sinai for a second opinion. So if I hadn't come to Cedar sinai I know 100% that my diagnosis would not have been found. I was diagnosed with autoimmune hepatitis. About three quarters of the way through the appointment, she looked at me and told me, we know what you have, we know how to treat you, and you're going to get better. And I looked at my husband and I just started to cry. I was told the news that would sort of change my life forever. And they said, Ms. Garcia, you have a mass. I had a 25 pound ovarian tumor. So it was not IBS. <laughs> um, and that's when I found out I had cancer. I was diagnosed with endometriosis that my surgeon had said was one of the worst cases of endometriosis in a young person she had ever seen in her career. I was diagnosed with microvascular heart disease. I was diagnosed with a 97% blockage and a 94% blockage in left and right coronary arteries. I was diagnosed with IBS with SIBA. And he says, honey, it's your arteries. It's your small arteries like I suspected that are not functioning properly. I feel like finally, someone listened. Finally, I was somewhere where they cared, where they listened. As a woman, you need to listen to your own body. You need to be your own advocate. If you need help, don't be afraid to ask for it. It's okay. Get a second opinion, a third opinion, fourth opinion. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. And don't take no for an answer. I was shocked and surprised at the disparity between how men and women are treated. And I was just so pleased to find out that Cedar sinai is trying to bridge the gap in women's health. I'm delighted that there are teams of brilliant people doing studies, doing research. It's vital, it's just very important, very important. So I hope you gathered from that video the sorts of things that uh, a lot of women have gone through in terms of their medical treatment and not being able to 
get the right diagnosis. Uh, for those of you wondering, well, oh, it's just in America, this video. I have personal experience with my friend who I met um, during one of my training sessions, who for six years had to wait to be diagnosed with endometriosis. For those six years, she was experiencing terrible period pains, vomiting during that pain, um, and was just told by all of her doctors, oh, it's just normal. But we know in the medical uh, in the medical field that such pain is not normal. As you're gonna see later, we have a pain scale, which is flawed in and of itself, but these sorts of pain levels aren't normal. During those six years, she was going to the NHS, and this is no, um, detriment at this I'm not speaking in detriment to the doctors there I'm just speaking in terms of the medical knowledge which they are making their decisions based off which you're going to see later on uh, in my slides has been flawed in and of itself um, she had been opened up for in an operation and still the diagnosis wasn't seen but the moment she uh, went to a private doctor within three days of them hearing of her symptoms uh, the doctor just said immediately oh I think this is endometriosis and she had um, she had her endometriosis taken out, which is on the first layer of her uterus, and she's able to live a normal life and we just need to have this operation maybe every three years. Now, as you can see there, we have two types of inequality put in one. She luckily, she had gender against her, but luckily she didn't have her socioeconomic status against her and she could pay for this treatment. But as you're going to see, everything is interlinked your race, your gender, your um, socioeconomic status and everything else that you uh, said in the first mini quiz slides. In her experience, she was lucky in terms of getting any sort of diagnosis when some women go for years without having a diagnosis and thus going without treatment and thus having worse symptoms later on and possibly even dying earlier because of such symptoms and such um, medical mal malpractice, um, but we're gonna see how that can happen. So first I would like to go to this slide. So where has the gender bias come from? Now uh, I'm going to leave out the elephant in the room, which is sexism, but we're gonna first, we're gonna go straight down into medical practice and research practice and how this may have come about. A lot, uh, in many, many studies across the world, women have been underrepresented underrepresent, under in studies of disease mechanisms and treatment. When women are ignored, researchers might miss differences in the way the female body responds to therapies, giving doctors little guidance about how to prescribe drugs for each sex. This is what I was talking about before, in that doctors can only go off the research which has been done. The research can only make um, claims and can only make uh, conclusions based off the data which they take in and the data can only represent the people who have been studied. Only one third, for example, of cardiovascular clinical trial subjects are women and those trials that do include women, just 31% report results by sex. However, we know that we are biologically different and thus, of course, it would be clear that different uh, medical illnesses would manifest differently based on gender. Um, one of the reasons women fare worse is that they are underrepresented and the gender bias against women in clin clinical trials stems from 1977. In 1977, a decision was made by the FDA that barred women of reproductive age from participating in phase one and early phase two studies unless they relate to life-threatening illnesses. For those who don't know, early phase one and early phase two are the stages that come before, say for example, the last stage of a clinical trial in order for a drug to come out to the public. There are many trials that have to happen before anything is available to the public. Now, on one hand, the reason the FDA did this is they didn't want to endanger women of reproductive age because we know that in a trial, we don't know what the results are gonna be. That's the whole reason we have a trial. However, the main problem with this is that the drugs that are being created or the, the treatment research that is being done on the people who are not women, so the men in these trials, 
they're going to create drugs and create treatments that women of reproductive age would have to take. So you can see there's a paradoxical element in there, not wanting to harm women in the trials, but then harming more women later on who take treatment that wasn't even tested for them. Um, the FDA then reversed this ban at around the same time that the US National Institutes of Health Revitalization Act of 1993 required that women and minorities be included in any government funded clinical health research. There's another problem there because not all research is government funded. Um, however, it was good that they reversed this ban. However, even now, females are often neglected before and during drug trials uh, that enlist human subjects. Um, and even with animal testing, <laughs> which I thought was mad when I realized when I was doing my own research, even with animal testing, they use it when they're testing on mice, for example, they still use mostly male subjects. It's important to test or to do trials if you are going to do human trials on the widest variety of people that you can in order to create a drug or a treatment which is available, which would be available to everyone. Yeah. yeah. So how has uh, such a gender bias been manifested in terms of the patient themselves? So I talked about how the treatments have been biased and what about patients? Often access to resources and opportunities can differ between where you are in the world. So luckily I think here in the UK, most women have access to resources and opportunities quite easily. However, in many parts of the world, women have to ask for permission from their male guardians, so that would be their husband, their father, their uncles, to access such resources and opportunities. On the other hand, even in the UK with uh, resources and opportunities, it might be the opportunity to go to a maybe a clinical trial. And there are still some myths involved with a lot of people thinking, oh, a woman shouldn't go. And that's always a personal choice. But if it's based on the fact that, oh, you shouldn't go, you're going to um, ruin your fertility or things like that, which are reasons why a lot of women will not have access, even if it's just social access to these opportunities. There's also decision making in the household, which I mentioned just before, that depending on where you are in the world, you might not have a decision to go and seek medical care. And now in terms of even males, males in terms of health seeking behavior actually have um, a, a lower, their decreased presentation to mental health services, for example, despite increased needs. Um, in terms of our social, how we've set up socially, a lot of the times male, males feel like they must be stronger, that they have to be the protector. And unfortunately that comes linked with feeling as though they shouldn't go and present to medical uh, places to go and help with mental health, even with physical health. Often they'll say, oh, it's not <laughs> that bad. <laughs> but you know, we should on a, a large scale, especially in such a developed nation, be able for everyone, have it accessible to everyone to go to these services and not feel like there's some sort of social block and harmful social expectations. These are based, the harmful social expectations basically covers the top three points in that the expectations socially can manifest badly in your medical expectation. Medis medicine can only help those who come to medical places and collect it or come to medical physicians and present with illnesses. Unfortunately, you can't if you don't present. And that's the main gender bias in terms of patients themselves. Okay. <laughs> Got some animations here which are playing up, but now we'll move on. So the third reason is race. And there is racial and ethnic disparities in diagnosis and treatment. And I'll be talking about um, where this rooted from and what its consequences are, even today with our modern medicine. But first, we are different. So before we go into how medical practice has 
failed a lot of racial minorities. I first wanted to input this slide just to understand that there is differences between race. So um, here we have an article in which I've taken out a section of it. In general, black people are more salt sensitive than white people and respond better to diuretics and CCBs than to ACE inhibitors or beta blockers as monotherapy. The mechanisms behind these differences are elusive but are not due to sodium dietary intake. That's a lot of words, but what I want you to take from this is to do with hypertension. And now, uh, if anyone wants to open their mic, has anyone heard that um, more, more black people have hypertension because we have more <laughs> salt in our diet? Yeah. Has anyone heard that before? Yeah, yeah, very yeah. often. We were even taught yeah. this in our, I remember it was my GCSE science lesson. Um, and we were told that, oh, it's because um, black people, minority ethnics, um, season their food more with salt with salt more than um what their white counterparts and this was in a science lesson and this is wrong <laughs> exactly there are a lot of assumptions which i want to make clear to you and Zarina will be making clear to you that are taken in medicine and we have to understand that medicine is always growing and uh even biomedical science is always growing but the assumptions can often lead to unhealthy perceptions yeah this article even surprised me when I was reading about it, and there are many articles like it that speak. All this is saying is that the reasons why we have higher um, rates, black people have higher rates of hypertension. Yes, it includes salt intake in your diet. I'm not saying eat as much salt as possible. In fact, I'm saying the opposite because black people have been scientifically proven to be more salt sensitive. sensitive. And this last sentence, is what I want us to base on. The mechanisms behind these differences are elusive, but are not due to dietary sodium intake. So this is just an example of how we are different and yet there's been biases or assumptions made, which hasn't helped, I think, with the treatment of such a um, disease such as hypertension. Thus, the evidence-based guidelines for prevention, treatment, and management of hypertension inadequately, inadequately address the excess risk of high blood pressure for African Americans in this specific study. So yeah, that was just an example of how we are different, but the differences should not make your treatment and how you are treated be different. Yeah, so I just wanted to make a few points before we move on to um, my section of the presentation. Firstly, I want to make clear that race is a social construct. It's not biological. It's not scientific. Um, second of all, we're going to be talking about some um, sensitive content in this one. So a trigger warning for anyone. Um, I will say it before I go move on to the presentation. And thirdly, this um, we know that racism, um, prejudice, discrimination, is um, prevalent in our world today and it's a massive issue and the medical field is not immune to this no pun intended <laughs> <laughs> it's not immune to um, uh, implicit bias and this is especially dangerous because these people doctors nurses healthcare assistants anyone in the medical field are responsible for people's lives and this is why we're talking about it now um so yeah just take that um bear that in mind and um it's not all doom and gloom we will be talking about solutions as well so the first thing is um does anyone want to say any myths about physical racial differences that they've heard of before so what i mean is um uh, statements that are like um, personally i've heard uh I've heard people saying that uh, black people are more stronger, mm -hmm. like they're more uh, muscular, muscular, did you say that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that they're so stronger, therefore they, um, a bit, it's like they're stronger, they're, they're resistant to almost many things, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that is a big one as well. Uh, does anyone else want to throw another myth about physical racial differences? Yeah, I think the, the, <clears throat> the one that's been said about pain yeah, I know a lot of black women complain that you know when they're in labor and they come that they're in pain, they yeah. actually told that they're overreacting because um there's an assumption that they have a higher tolerance yeah. of pain. 
yeah. yeah. Pain management is a massive topic. Big one. Um, and again, we'll be talking about that. Does anyone else have any more uh, myths? I'll, I'll tell you one more thing. You know, um, with sickle cell anemia, most of the people, because it affects most of black people um, in most cases. So um, a majority of people say that uh, black people were pretending until a research was done about it. Uh -huh. But it was known that they, their pain was um, like it wasn't, it was like uh, imagine, like it was neuro neurological pain. Like obviously they were just imagining it. Wow. wow. Mm -hmm. So they weren't treated in terms of uh, their pain. They say that they were pretending, but actually after the uh, after the research, they came to realize actually it's, re it's real actually. Yeah. So they because they relied on morphine all the time. Yeah. yeah. So these are just a few um, statements, uh, myths that um, are held. So black people's nerve endings are less sensitive than white people's. So again, that goes into um, black people feel less pain. Black people have thicker skin than white people. I personally heard this in primary school, yep. um, that their hands, um, the skin on their hands are thicker, that the soles of the feet are thicker. Again, this is a myth. Black people's blood coagulates more quickly than white people's. So these are just three examples. But actually, these aren't antiquated 19th century beliefs. These are beliefs held by half of medical students and residents surveyed um, in a study by the National Academics of Science. And this was a research study done in the United States. So if the people who are learning about anatomy, physiology, how the body works, hold these false beliefs, how much more uh, are these beliefs common in normal people by the public? And this is why it's so dangerous, because again, people's lives are in the hand. The decisions they make to do with the treatment and the medications they give people mean life or death, literally. Mm -hmm. So there is a failure to treat pain. And there was a study um, done um, in America, and it showed that Black and Hispanic people from children who needed adenoidectomies or tonsillectomies to elders in hospice care received inadequate pain management compa compared to their white counterparts. And again, this is the implicit bias that black people feel less pain or they can, um, they can bear or take a lot more pain than white people. And despite the fact that black and Hispanic people are less likely than white people to misuse prescription opioids, they are less likely than white patients to receive any pain medication and more likely to receive lower doses despite higher pain scores. So not only um, do they not misuse prescription opioids, they actually receive less pain. That means they're being unfairly treated and it just shows the inequality in medicine. So this is a pain scale chart that's actually used um, in our hospitals. Um, I think Helen, you're a nurse. Um, just to confirm, this is real. <laughs> this is what we use to um, assess pain. As you can see, it looks very childish. There's, it goes from zero to 10 and there's pictures of faces and it goes from a big smile to a smaller smile to an even smaller smile. And I don't know about you, but for me looking at this, I think it's very behind comparing to the technologies that we have now and all the new innovations that we have in therapeutics. This seems ancient. How are we assessing pain, which is what we use to diagnose and give treatment on a scale of one to 10 with images of cartoon faces from no pain, minor pain, moderate pain and severe pain. It's flawed massively and it needs to be changed. There needs to be uh, an improvement in how we assess pain. And I'll be talking about um, the fact that there are some research into finding a better way of assessing pain. So, and another thing is that culturally, um, people are not the same in expressing if they're in pain. Um, 
is to do with your personality as well. Again, like um, the more I said, there's a social uh, conception that men should be strong. Um, so obviously they're not gonna scream and shout. They're gonna try to withhold it. Um, and if a nurse is looking at them, even though they might be at a pain scale of 10, they might, their face might be at a four. Um, additionally, some people, we as humans are not good, um, uh, we're not good at judging our own pain or we're not good at judge or telling other people how we feel. Um, so again, there's inconsistencies and inaccuracies with that. And also with the cultural differences as well in how you present with pain. In a lot of cultures, just grinning and bearing it is a very common thing. And so when asked, oh, how bad is your pain? You could be in a nine excruciating slash unbearable, but you're not crying. Your face isn't crinkled up. You're just in a more five, very distressed state with just a calm face because in terms of culture and how you grew up or depending on what you've been exposed to as a child, understanding how you should present your pain is very different or just grinning and bearing it. There are so many different phrases. There's stiff upper lip, there's grinning and bearing it. These all come from social constructs of how we should emit or show our pain. And thus, this is why and it's flawed. So <clears throat> there were studies on um, pediatricians. And again, most of the studies I'm going to be talking about are studies that were um, done in America. However, this doesn't mean that it's not, it just doesn't mean that it's just an American um, problem. It's a global problem. It's a problem that we have in the UK as well. So um, this was a statement. As pediatricians implicit pro-white bias increase, which means that um, they're more biased in um, thinking that white people are not better, but um, are less likely to, um, they are more likely to feel pain. So as the implicit pro-bias increased, prescribing narcotic medication decreased for American African-American patients, but not for the white patients. So how they came to this conclusion was they did uh, an implicit bias test. Um, I'll actually be putting a link of one um, it's a test that was created at Harvard and you can do it yourself. So implicit bias doesn't mean that um, you're intentionally or consciously um, being biased in your decisions. It's just um, un it's an unconscious bias. And that's where we, our bias comes from, what we see in the media, what, what we've been told, our experiences. So us humans, doctors, are not um, immune to this sort of bias. And this has a correlation with um, how they choose to treat people. And as you can see here, as their pro-white bias increased, um, the narcotic medication decreased for African-American patients, but not for white patients. So what needs to be done? So this is the solutions that are um, advised by the Association of American Medical Colleagues, colleges, sorry. So the number one, um, the first thing on the list is to collect data. So they say, if bias exists, it will show up in data. Every healthcare setting needs to collect data on pain management by patients, race and ethnicity, as well as gender, insurance status, and other significant characteristics. Healthcare systems need to review the data regularly and create strategies to address disparities. So like Namoya said, research is so important. Um, research needs to represent all types of peoples race, ethnicity, gender, insurance status, and other significant ca characteristics. The only way we can um, make accurate and efficient and successful changes is that if we, is that, um, is through the data that we've collected. If we don't research, if we don't collect data, we won't improve basically. The other one is to identify our own biases. So um, like I said, there are tests um, that uh, show uh, your biases, your implicit biases. And sometimes it can create a defensiveness in us, but it's so important for our own personal development and how we see the world. It says here, to address our biases, we need to first recognize them. And one way to explore our automatic associations is by taking an implicit association test. It's a valuable exercise in self-awareness and humility. 
but it can provoke defensiveness. Another way to do it, instead of just taking the test, is to pay very close attention in everyday life when we notice that we've made a mistaken assumption. So we can't help it, we are humans, we do make judgments, but you need to check yourself. Every time you make a, an assumption that's mistaken or is, you know it's false, you need to hold yourself accountable to that and rewire how you view other people. The next one is to remove as much individual discretion as possible. So like we said with the pain scale chart, it's, an, it's a choice that you make individually based on 10 smiley faces that needs to be um, changed. Because like I said, um, it'd be better if there were more clinical guidance, standardized checklists and system-wide protocols that leaves less room for individual discretion and therefore less uh, bias that influence patient care. And this can be done through the continued research and search for objective measures in pain. So one of the um, new or novel ways to measure pain is through um, developing a blood test using biomarkers that can objectively diagnose pain and its intensity. So rather than subjectively say, oh, my head hurts, oh, on a scale of one to 10, how much does it hurt? maybe a five, um, we'd actually, we've actually developed blood tests using biomarkers that go into our body and actually see how much pain is produced because pain, just like everything else, is chemicals in our bodies, um, things that can be tested and can be evidence-based. So there's no reason that we should continue using a, a, an assessment using smiley faces. <laughs> so this is where I'm going to talk about um, some disgusting and gruesome uh, things that have been done in the past by physicians, by doctors. Um, so if you don't want to hear it, you can mute it or not look at it. Um, but I've tried to take away some of the more um, offensive parts. So Thomas Hamilton um, was a physician in the, south and, in the southern part of America. And he actually used an, an, an enslaved man called John Brown. And um, he wanted to prove the theory that black people had thicker skin and, than white people. So he did experiments on slaves and this was actually a norm um, in his time in the area that he lived in. But I just want to drive home the fact that this is a theory that he had and this is a bias that he had. Therefore, the experiments, the gruesome experiments that he did and the results they have, he'll interpret that so that his theory is proven correct. This is um, gonna be shown in the next person, Samuel Cartwright. He, there was a thought that um, black people had a, a deficiency in their lungs. So Samuel Cartwright wrote a paper reported on the diseases and physical peculiarities of the black race published in May 1851. So he supposed that the physical difference between whites and blacks included the claim that black people had lower lung capacity. And this false claim has wormed its way into modern day um, education and practices. Today, most commercially available spirometers used around the world, spirometers are machines that um, measure lung capacity, measure lung capacity um, while to diagnose and monitor respiratory illnesses have risk correction, again, this is today, built into the software, which controls for the assumption that black people have less lung capacity than white people. Me and Moya have done uh, experiments and um, have been in labs where we use these spirometers, but we didn't know that no. they have race correction in it. Um, A lot of these things that we use, we don't get told about their race correction or, or the origins yeah exactly the origins or assumptions that they were built from which is the, uh, part of the problem itself yeah so this was a quote from um, a writer at the new york times linda Villarosa, and she said over centuries the two most persistent physiological myths are that one black people were impervious to pain and two had weak lungs that could be strengthened through hard work these myths worm their way into scientific consensus and they remain rooted in modern day medical education and practice. 
So in her, in um, Lundi Brown's 2014 book, Breathing Race into Machine, The Surprising Career of a Spirometer from Plantation to Genetics, she said that race correction is still taught to medical students and described in textbooks as scientific fact and standard practice. This just goes to show it, these ideas weren't left behind in the 19th um, century, in the 1800s. These uh, ass um, assumptions, false beliefs are the foundation that modern medicine is built on. The origins of every single medical practice is rooted and um, originated in these false beliefs that have um, come out of ill, unethical practices um, and experiments that were done on black people. Medicine, modern day medicine has a bloody history and um, I don't think it's talked about um, enough. We pride ourselves the medical field to be evidence-based, to be scientific, to be research-led, but the actual basis of it is from theories that these scientists um, came up with their head and did experiments on um, themselves. And actually we still hold these today, um, even though they're not true. So some of you may have heard of another um, physician called J. Marion Sims. He's actually considered the father of gynecology. However, he also practiced these unethical um, and painful operations before anesthesia on enslaved women. So again, no more talks about gender. Not only were these um, uh, people um, subjected to this pain, um, they've also suffered from it. So in 1950, the 1850s, Sims opened the first ever women's hospital. When Sims patients died, the blame according to him was with the sloth and ignorance of their mothers and the black midwives who attended them. So again, this just goes to show the, the character that he was. This is uh, the person who has a statue in um, Central Park claiming of um, boasting about his intelligence and all the findings and that he had but um, the context of how he came to um, these findings are not taught enough. Um, we praise him for uh, the practices that he's um, found, but we don't give credit. I mean, we, we shouldn't credit him for that. We should know about his history as well. And even though anesthesia was introduced in 1846, he chose not to use them. And you might be thinking, why were these physicians doing such unethical and gruesome experiments? Well, it's because around the 1830s, the abolitionist movement led to efforts to identify black inferiority to justify slavery. So the lung capacity, um, they were trying to prove that, oh, through hard work, it can be solved. Um, with black people having thicker skin, it showed that, oh, they're built for labor and they're built for working in fields and in plantations. With the feeling of pain, it just, re it just reduces um, their humanity. This is why they did all of these um, experiments. So again, half the original articles in the 1863 Southern Medical and Surgical Journal dealt with experiments on black people. And black women have uh, the highest maternal mortality rates. Someone talked about um, Black women are sometimes being told that they exaggerate their pain, that um, it's not that bad, that they should deal with it. But that's just their bias. That's just, um, they're wrong. They should treat um, people that are, are in pain appropriately. And this is a figure that shows that for every um, 13 deaths in white women, there are 44 deaths in black women. So this is just, a graphic for you. For every 13 white women who die during pregnancy or within one year of giving birth in America, there are 41 black women. So it's around the 41, 44. For every, th these are real people. We, d we can't forget um, that the, the people behind the statistics, these people have families, these people have friends. There shouldn't be such disparities in how, um, in mortality rates in the 21st century everyone should be um, treated equally. We shouldn't be seeing the gaps that we are seeing now. And this is all because 
of the origin of medicine. But there is hope. We can see that the origins have led us to quite a disparate and um, disheartening present, but there has been hope. So there was a black medic uh, who in the UK, he came up with this Mind the Gap book um, because uh, and it only taught uh, how to diagnose white patients and create a handbook to show how conditions look on darker skin. Uh, this is true. I'm testament to the fact that within our textbooks in universities, in schools, most, in fact, I haven't seen, <laughs> I haven't seen a picture that showed um, an illness and then how to diagnose it on black skin. There is always uh, a white patient there and showing their skin. For example, meningitis, which has the characteristic rash where if you put a glass um, against it, it won't, go, it won't go white. But on my skin, how would you be able to tell if I had that rash? Of course, there are all the other symptoms and we're not neglecting the fact that a trained doctor should be able to notice these other symptoms, but specifically having one of the things, one of those symptoms labeling it in a book next to a picture and not disclaiming that you will not be able to see this on another patient and seeing and putting another photo on maybe someone with darker skin, even an Asian, a black person with darker skin to show how it would look on a different person's skin is creating neglect. Even the most studious doctor could go through their whole life and have studied every book and still manage to create these disparities between black and white patients simply because they weren't told. I find it so disheartening that it took us to 2020 for a student or a black medic, sorry, to have to write their own textbook in 2020. However, I look at it with hope considering that um, I'm still in the field of education and hopefully I'll be able to learn from this book if not within my institution, at least with myself. And I just wanted to show everyone this book. Um, yeah which has been in all these news articles. So this just reinforces the fact that we need to collect data, we need to identify our own biases, we need to establish educational programmes, we need to remove as much individual discretion as possible and continue the search for objective measures um, in different races, in different ethnicities and skin colours. Exactly. And that is then. These are some of the references. We'll include all of the references when we put it into our YouTube um, and put some of our key references in, uh, send them out to all of the watchers. So, are there any questions, statements, testimonies? We've delved into a lot of topics today and we just want to know if there's any questions before our cahoot. Questions or statements or comments? No, <laughs> like the it audience has been heavy. overwhelmed. Yeah. Oh, actually, I was going to say one thing. Um, I know you're doing a very good job, actually, and I'm, I really, really miss you. Or oh, miss you, girl, because I, I'm really enjoying your topics. You present them really well. It's, it would be interesting for you to uh, do a research on this. Um, I'm sure you you have play, you you don't have enough time to do this as well as uh, you know do what you're we doing. Welcome, we welcome. Yeah, any we were going to say we were going to say it, um further down, but we can do it now. If anyone has any suggestions of what they want to see in the, in the future. future, but yeah. So what was it that you were thinking of, Helen? So I was I was thinking about you know like your your experience as a student as a like about like a medical student while you're still studying because not not a lot of people medical as a students, yeah. as an yeah. ethnic minority your experience in comparison to the to the white uh, counterparts I know it's very difficult to do this because obviously the support is not there I know this firsthand because I've gone through this when I was doing my sickle cell um, uh, dissertation because I did I couldn't find any of the articles all the articles I got were from America and most of them were very biased so it was very difficult for me to to even do it but you know it would be interesting to just see your point of view like it would be a good topic as well just to find out how you feel I know this is the beginning and you're doing really honestly you are really good I don't know how I don't I don't even <laughs> think you know how good you are <laughs> you're really good honestly oh, I'm really proud of you you're doing a very good job and I should miss this very much no oh, thank you so thank much. you so much and thank you for your suggestion yeah um, yes. it's yeah definitely an interesting one and we'd love to share our experiences it's not when we thought about ourselves as well so that's really yeah. good 
Do you have any other questions about? Okay, um, I think my question would be like for people who come from developing countries, like, okay, I come from Botswana, I'm not based there, but you know, we, we normally depend on medical research from the West. Yeah. It comes with so, a lot of um, biases. This is a um which then uh, um but you know most of the time we don't really do a lot of medical research so is the solution for african countries to invest in medical research to yeah. to solve the problem yeah so obviously um i don't know maybe we do have a government uh, person here a lot of us won't be able to do this ourselves but yes one of the sources is making sure that in these developing countries that we're not relying on um, research from the West, not because research from the West is inherently flawed in every single capacity. We know that we've come through a lot of uh, a good, good developments from research from the West. However, it always comes with their own cultural uh, bias. It also comes with the fact that in certain racial or um, geographic locations, there are different illnesses that you're going to come across. And so you're going to put more research into these things. Whereas maybe in tropical countries or maybe uh when you're near the equator you have a whole nother set of illnesses or diseases which come about and definitely um, i can't do this but obviously definitely it would be good to invest in research within your own countries yeah. i was actually gonna say i do believe there is great research being done in countries that are not in the west that are actually very good it's just to do with prestige yes if an article uh, research study done by I don't know Harvard or Stanford or Oxford was to come out to do with cardiovascular diseases in um, black and minority ethnics were to come out they'll probably get a lot more reading citations um, than a university who is actually still as good and maybe even better in another country it's just recognition and how the yeah. scientific community works um, so I do think there's a lot of good research being done. It's just, it's not getting as much exposure. Yeah. Another one more comment is just, I feel like uh, most of the research that's done in America and then they come back to the West. So America seems to, to be the countries that takes the lead in most of these researches. So they don't have like, um, you don't, you don't have a, have a true representation of the, um, of the public. I mean, all the, all, all the researches that are done in America ended up um, normally end up in 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 England or in Europe because you find that a lot of them are done in America and then come to, to England I know in England there's researches as well going on but in my in, in the majority of time you find that all the research that are done are from America because you look at the articles I don't know because of the diseases I really don't know I don't I've never understood that so I think that's gonna be it would be interesting to find out the primary researches from um, how they are used in uh, in in England um, that are not really it, 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 like I mean to say just England based really. I yeah I I do want to make a point here that um, especially in terms of the research that we put here and research mm -hmm. done in science now it is mm -hmm. peer reviewed. What that means is even if one company does it in America, it must mm -hmm. be peer reviewed with many other yeah. scientists across the world so in the uk in germany and even in uh, the east in china it has to be peer reviewed so i don't want you to take away from this discussion that all research you know you can't rely on it and yeah. i don't need to take that away from what we're discussing because a lot of the mm -hmm. time yes there's a lot of research done in america it's big it's got a lot of money behind it um mm -hmm. it's got a lot of prestige yeah. and it's got a lot of exactly long-term institutions which have been built on research for a longer time okay. um, but yeah so I don't need to take away that all oh, you know there's no no research you can be able to follow it because as you can see we use research <laughs> to, to, to back up our own study on the research so yeah. Uh, yeah it has been peer reviewed but you are right there is um I guess uh, a lot of research is done over there but it is mm -hmm. peer reviewed oh, uh, sorry may I comment yes um as um, you've been trying to allude, research needs a lot of money to be done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Americans normally have enough money at their disposal to do research. Yeah. But yeah. Um, as you are saying, the more, most of the research now mm -hmm. has to be conducted across many countries. Because if you conduct research in one country only, there's a problem that that research cannot be generalized to the whole world. Mm 
Yeah. yeah. So if you conduct research in multiple centers, some in Africa, some in Asia, some in Europe, some in the USA, your research will automatically have a higher value because it's easy to extrapolate to the general population. Then the other comment I wanted to make was that there is um, research going on in Africa and there are some textbooks that are being written in Africa. And um, also to say that some of this research is done in conjunction with the Europeans or the Americans because research again I say is a resource heavy thing. So they will need to come with the money and then you use that money. But some of the research, primary research is being done in Africa. You might be working with European counterparts or American counterparts. Yeah. And um, America is a big and rich country. Yeah. And uh, the riches of its research is something that we should celebrate. Having said that there's quite a lot of research also being not as much, but being done in Europe. And uh, more importantly, there is some primary research that is being done in Africa. And um, if you look at some of the textbooks, like I have seen in Zambia, there are some like color atlases for diseases such as HIV AIDS that have yeah. been produced in Zambia by Zambians working on that research. And I'm sure it's not just Zambia. There will be some, a lot from South Africa and a lot from East Africa. By East Africa, I mean Kenya, uh, Uganda, and Tanzania, although some people may include Rwanda and Burundi. Thank you. Thank you. Are any there any other um, topics that people would want to hear about? Ladies, I would like to say once again, thank you. Um, I join all those that um, praised you for your performance. I am very grateful and I am proud of you. Um, you promised us in the beginning that you will give us solutions. And besides you too, you too, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> what other solutions there are there uh, to, to hope yeah, that your generation, your children's generation, will have a better quality of medical care. I know that you two and many others like you are the beginning, but give us a, a little uh, presentation or, or a sentence of hope. How will the future look like? How are we going to clean up the mess? <laughs> <laughs> well, some of the some of the solutions uh, which were mentioned in some of the parts were, say for example, you feel like you are being uh, you have uh, been the victim of some uh, some inequality in medicine. So always get a first, second, third opinion. Look it up yourself. Do not be afraid of research. Do not be afraid to ask others you know who have been involved with research. What does this mean? Does it, am I being just a Google, am I just being a Google doctor and letting Google tell me that I have some terrible unknown disease? Or maybe do I actually have something and the doctors are not assessing me correctly? So in terms of right now, getting that third, second, first, second, third opinion, if you have the money, <laughs> try private. Um, in terms of the future, we know that research is being, research itself is being analyzed and assessed by not just, you know, the people above us who are already within the research. Um, the only reason we could find all this research that talked about where research comes from is because people are researching it. And as Zarina said, there are some new methods that are coming out. So instead of, you know, that pain scale, we can find the biomarkers in blood. So just to, have hope that things are changing you don't have to wait for us so why we hope you will join them in um obviously the fight for equality in everything we do and for example we're in the biomedical and pharmacology uh education so we hope to you know improve that i was gonna say um with like everything it starts with education um it's about being humble enough um to recognize that we all do have implicit biases 
but then it's not just recognize, recognizing them, it's taking action as well. Um, so even though um, these things are real, we can educate ourselves. Um, there's never a time to stop learning. Um, so I think that's my advice to keep being curious because we would have never uh, learned this research. We would never have known the origins of these things if we didn't go out and learn about them. So yeah, don't stop learning about it. If you're curious about more inequalities in medicine, um, search them. <laughs> Um, I think one one research um, study that you can do is um, adherence to chronic medication in the church. I remember talking to a lady, um, she's a nurse in South Africa, and she was saying that um, Seventh-day Adventists are most likely to default on chronic tre um, treatments, like if people are HIV positive or any other chronic um, illnesses. You know, with the whole health message and emphasis on mm um what natural remedies and stuff that sometimes people stop yeah. taking Probably maybe let's say ARVs yeah. because they believe if they're yeah. vegan yeah. and um, taking natural remedies then they will live longer without needing medication and um or that in the church yeah. people are not um we don't take like if you're depressed you don't take antidepressants because um there's a, a, um, a belief that it, it interferes with your spirituality and stuff. Um, I think it'd be nice to hear from like a medical perspective, if it's really um, a bias and how we address it as a church. Um, yeah, I think, in, yeah. yeah. Um, I, well, this is what my dad says, <laughs> that God's given the doctors, the nurses, the healthcare assistants, the intelligence um, to create these um, medicines and these drugs. I mean, I'm going into an industry that literally does the clinical trials, the making of the vaccines, the making of the drugs. Um, but uh, with anything, of course, medicine isn't the whole picture. God's greater than a drug, than the knowledge that we have. So I think take the medication, but know that if the medication doesn't work, then that's not the final say so that's not the end of the story um if it's god's will then he will heal you from it so i think both <laughs> but we'll do a topic on that um, can i chip in yes um just to say i mean i think while we while we say that medication has its time and its place i think we can't lose sight of the and it's a fact that it's a business yeah um yeah. big pharma is a business <laughs> And they they are in, they're not they're not doing what they do because they love us. They're not doing what they do necessarily because they care about us. I think we need to remember that first and foremost, profit, unfortunately, is driving a lot of what is going on. And if you look at the last ten years about the explosion of illnesses that need medication, especially with young children. Um, with various disorders that you think to yourself, were these things always there? Do we need to have young people on medication? And so on and so forth. Um, I don't believe you should throw the baby out with the bathwater. There is a time and a place for everything. I'm the kind of person that if my circumstances are that I need medication, I will take it. But if, if I can cook up some ginger and some garlic, and some honey and lemon and cayenne pepper, and it takes my cold away. <laughs> then I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna take lemon sip. So, um, just bit. I think it's important to remember that when you see new illnesses, it's not because they're new and they weren't there before. It's that there's more research done. For example, even with mental illnesses, which were not taken seriously at all until recently, obviously there is going to be more drugs available because we have more research into such illnesses. Um, I think it's a very good topic actually, and we can put that on our list for hopefully future topics. But um, yeah, just even just, yeah, exactly. Um, and I think it's also a topic which will be, you know, talked about a lot, so. Hello, can I also say something? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, pastor is asking, how can we 
what are the solutions, some of the solutions in these uh, maladies that we're facing right now. We know that there is an inequality in medicine and just like any other uh, industries or uh, uh, life pursuit, but what I'm saying is, I think it should start with us. Number one, I think we need to be assertive. Uh, before I go to doctor, I self-diagnose myself. <laughs> what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, is that uh, I will research on my symptoms. I research on on uh, what I'm, you know, if I'm sure. Let's say I have, uh, I have gout. I will research on it. I know what it is. And sometimes you help the doctor to, you know. To <laughs> That's what I, you know, some of these things because I'm also exposed in the medical thing. But I, I'm not, I'm not pretending to be like doctors. But what I'm saying is, in the advance of our technology and everything, the knowledge is there. Mr. Google is there to help us, etc. With the research, <laughs> I think we also need to, 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 okay. to know about this. And second one, I'm, I'm with Chris, Chris Adams. Um, we need to go back to the, some natural remedies, natural remedies. Uh, what I'm saying is the natural remedies can on, only be effective if uh, our diseases are not in the curable, curative stage. It's always in the preventive side. It's much better not to get sick. Yeah. Uh, that's why we need to, to make our body well, our, our body healthy. And last but not the least, I would like to congratulate you, both of you. I think you are the future of our medical services. <laughs> I'll be happy and glad to, to see you in the medical world, trying to be, uh, you know, trailblaze some of these things. We need more people like you in the medical world. And hopefully some others will also follow as a politician to <laughs> change the laws about the medical yes. thing yes. in this country. It's a holistic approach. Yes. I, hope, I hope some of our uh, youth will become politicians. They will change the law of this land <laughs> that it will become equal opportunities to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have a um, great hello. Yeah. If I may just uh, come in there, yeah. um, just to... Uh, add to the solutions that uh, Pastor was saying um, should be found. Uh, one of the solutions is what I uh, alluded to earlier on. At this point in time, no person can go to Zambia, whether they are from America or from wherever, and carry out medical research on Zambians without Zambians being involved. Mm -hmm. And these young Zambians, and I'm sure it will be the same in most of the African countries, are challenging the premises on which the research is being done. And that is changing the, the, the thinking. We are not just going to use Zambians as um, um, guinea pigs or for observational studies without Zambians being involved. And most of the African countries are demanding this. And during that, those studies, the young um, Africans are challenging the premises on which um, unwarranted assumptions are being made and that is contributing to the body of evidence. Yeah. We, you did say earlier on to say medicine is evidence-based and the best way to challenge some of these things is when, when you show that there is no evidence on which this thing is based on, you challenge the evidence that is there yeah. and prove that the evidence is shaky because it's bound to be evidence-based, they are bound to take note. Thank you. Yeah. So um, we actually have a collaboration here um, yes. that you guys should be excited about. <laughs> so it's coming up on the screen on now. The screen. So uh, we have here, we wanted to create some sort of poll or something, but uh, technology, unfortunately, we haven't been able to wrap our hands around it. I know we're Gen Z, we're meant to be able to. However, uh, we have uh, here, COVID-19, to be vaccinated or not to be vaccinated, that is a question. So those of you who are saying you're going to miss our talks, we actually have a talk with 
um, my dad. <laughs> um, so he's going to be doing this talk and we just wanted to see by, if anyone, if everyone can see on the bottom of their viewing screen, they have an option to raise your hand. So could everyone raise your hand if uh, you would like to see this or you'd be really interested in knowing about the vaccine and knowing whether you'd want to be vaccinated, sorry, <laughs> with COVID. So if you could raise your hand, if you'd like to see that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, but we've got clapping, we've got a raised hand. If it, yeah, if you don't know how to put it up, it, you can just raise your hand in person up, oh, good. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, that's gonna be, uh, I, I think you can step in, I think that's gonna be on the 10th of October. So uh, definitely, tune in uh, as we can see here he's professional he's in public health so he knows even more than we can we know just from <laughs> research and i think he'll be able to answer a lot of your questions and also anything that you want to know about a vaccine and because i know there's been a lot of talk talk about a vaccine is it going to be safe should some day adventists get the vaccine because it's going to be worldwide you know i think it will be really informative so yeah, that's going to be on the tent. If you want to say anything more about it. A little promo more is please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Um, the, um, I was um, sort of um, forced to come out of hibernation because um, a lot of people ask me questions about uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. And, um, and some of them are saying, well, you seem to be pro-vaccine and you against what the church is teaching. And I'm saying, I think the church is teaching about choice. But if you are to make a choice, you must be informed. You cannot make a choice unless you are informed. And uh, there's a lot of talk of saying, what if it's mandatory? Um, and those are some of the things that we'll look at. Not everything that is mandatory is necessarily bad in my view. For instance, at the moment, we are mandated to make sure that either your child goes to school or you homeschool them at home. Does that make schooling bad? No. Thank you so much, Maurice. I'm, I'm so waiting to hear you and to, to discuss this a little bit more uh, next, uh, next, it's next Saturday, isn't it? Next Sabbath next evening. Saturday, yeah. Saturday. Next Sabbath evening. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, ju ju just so you know, um, I never regret for taking all the vaccines required to go to Africa. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Amen. Never ever, because I was not <laughs> touched by any of the dangers that I faced there so a lot of mosquitoes fed on me yet <laughs> i did not get any malaria ladies kahoot and then at the end after we stop the recording we'll have time to chat a little bit more if anyone wants to chat isn't it of course yes. good kahoot time so um we have had some technical difficulties but being the innovative young people we are we have come something. up with a solution we're going to do a traditional quiz where we <laughs> say the question and you guys say the answer. So if everyone wants to take off their mic, uh, to, no, put on their mic, and we're going to ask these questions and just shout out the answer. And then after about okay. 10 seconds or 20 seconds, I'll put a timer on my phone, we'll reveal the answer. And if you can't speak out loud, please feel free to put your answers in the chat. Yeah, we'll be looking at the chat. So the first question is, people living in the poorest places in England will on average die how many years earlier than the richest? Seven. Two seconds. What was the answer? Seven. We've got seven. We've got seven. Any other answers? How many years on average earlier would someone in the poorest area die than in the richest? Are they doing it on Kahoot? No. Oh. <laughs> okay, it's really sorry. <laughs> Aren't they doing it on Kahoot? Oh, yeah. No, we we haven't. Our Kahoot didn't work. <laughs> As we said before, we have to change accounts to make our pro Kahoot. And unfortunately, this <laughs> failed us. So just shout out your answer. What do you think the answer is? I'll say seven, seven as well. We've got, five. We've We've got, got another seven. seven. Two seconds. Because okay. this was the first question, I'll give you like three more seconds. One, two, 
three. Nice. So yes, those you said seven are correct. So um, people living in the poorest places in England will on average die seven years earlier than the richest. Our next question is, how many times more likely are the poorest 20% of children who have a to have a severe mental condition than the richest? So how many times more likely is the poor child gonna have a mental illness than the rich child? Five. Got five? I got five. Four times. Four times. Four. Four. Oh, someone changed Four out of five, sorry. Four, okay, we've got two, two votes for four. Any other answers? Are you unmuted? A safe one as well. Four. We've got three here on the chat. Any others? Five seconds left. Okay. So the answer is four times more likely. So this is just talking about the socioeconomic disparity and not just physical, but mental health that unfortunately exists. So the third question is, women have been underrepresented in studies of disease mechanisms and treatment. True or false? True. 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 Any votes for true? Yeah, Anyone else want to put their vote in? True. Yeah. What true in the chat? So uh, that's one hundred percent yes. Women have been underrepresented in studies of disease mechanisms and treatment. Fourth question: What needs to be done to better the inequalities we spoke about in medicine? So this is a free for all. We just want to see what you gathered from what we said. So what are some of the solutions exactly? I think you mentioned five. I as mentioned well. five. Collecting data. data. Yes. Yes. Number one. Using proper pain um, gathering. Um, uh, data. Equipment, data, yeah. 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 yeah, so yeah. Be assertive. More research. Your personal input. <laughs> <laughs> but a good one. A good one, one, yes. But what is, there's one to do with your own mindset. Yes, so what was that? What was it called? Bias. Yeah, so to check your biases, definitely that's the one. And there, there was one I talked about. <sighs> I talked about all of this actually. <laughs> so the five were collecting data, checking your own biases, educational programs, making sure there's less um, need for individuals like doctors to assess um, your pain. And the third one is to make more innovative ways to um, assess pain. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, for every 13 white women who died from childbirth or childbirth related um, thing, how many black women died? 44. 44. 40, 49? 44. 40, 44. So, yeah, so there's many uh, different researches, but it is around the 41, 43, 44 um, section. Very unfortunate. Yes, and um, we shouldn't be seeing these kinds of um, statistics. Um, again, we need to get rid of that. So, eighth question: <laughs> How many medical students in the study held false beliefs on physiological differences? So this was the study I was talking about in the beginning about the myths yeah. of physiological or racial differences. How many medical students in the study held one or more beliefs? It was 50%. What, oh, about 50%? Oh, I shouldn't be shaking 50% held, held one or more, yes, of the biases. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. Correct. That's correct. So who is considered the father of modern gynecology? Samuel Cartwright. Well, vote for Samuel Cartwright. Seems. Seems, yeah. I would say Seems, I can't remember the first name. I don't know. Seems, Samuel Cartwright. Any other votes or any votes for these two? Davina <laughs> Amor. <laughs> no. The answer is no, we don't want someone, to. The answer is someone that doesn't deserve that title. Right. <laughs> so the actual answer is 
J. Marion Simpson. Marian. Oh. He's the father of modern gynecology. <laughs> that title only came through. Oh, I did it on this. That he um, performed unethical oh, experiments on enslaved oh, black women. And Samuel Cartwright, because I re someone said that, um, what isn't considered the father of um, modern gynecology. He's actually the person who had the theory that oh. um, black people had a deficiency in their lung capacity and therefore resulted in spirometers being created oh. to have a race correction. Yeah. Yes. So uh, next. Oh, the last, yeah, that's the last. One. That was the last question. Okay. Um, wait, wait, it's not showing. Um, we're sorry that we haven't been able to actually do our kahoot for our last session, but you know what? This just gives more push to join whatever next things that we do, in which everything will work. Please now look in the chat. We have links to some of the references that we used in today's um, talk. So these are like the main ones which we'd like to go with. And look at yourself. Um, of course, the ones that we're going to put in are lengthy and they will be available to you soon. Um, and we have our links to our PayPal to support us um, in terms of making all of these while you know being at uni and we have our YouTube link. So this is good for if you've missed one, if you wanna just remember, what did she say again? <laughs> Go onto the YouTube and you'll be able to see all of our health talks soon. We are working on editing everything, getting it all ready for you. So yeah, I definitely encourage you to go to the YouTube channel and subscribe, like, comment, and definitely share. And that brings us to the end of our final health talk in making research simple. This is the fifth and final one. We're so thankful and grateful that um, you guys decided to come and join us. When we first started this, we weren't sure how much of a, a reach it would have or who would come. And we just wanted to make a platform in order for people to come on, see that research is not as daunting and also be able to share their misconceptions and gain clarity on research that I guess is less available to everyone else so we're just really thankful that you just guys came yeah um so, uh, yes i was just gonna say I, I i really miss you girls i i was getting used to these topics <laughs> i've been looking forward i don't know what we can do to help you so that you can stay i i know you are having um your own researches at school you know at uni and then this is just a, another side side ones you do for us but it would be it would be really nice for you to continue so if if there's any support i think that the, the church should really support you guys because i think you're doing a great job really really great thank you, thank you so much and, and i wish you the very best more coming, sure. Sorry? There's more coming sure. yeah so um if there's nothing else we'll pray to close Oh, um, Uncle Morris, do you have your hand up? Oh, okay. Um, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we give you so much praise and thanks that you've been with me and Moya in um, creating these presentations to engage the church and the public with our scientific knowledge. We thank you so much that you've given us this opportunity to be able to do this. Thank you that you've facilitated us and that people have actually taken interest. I pray that um, these presentations have changed people's lives, their views and their understanding of health, medicine, um, well-being and their lifestyle. I hope we all make positive changes to our lives to better the world that we live in, whether that's um, addressing our own implicit bias, whether that's making healthier choices with our diet, whether that's um, giving blood or um, organ donation or following the rules of COVID and understanding that all these topics were relevant. And um, we thank you that we were able to share this with everyone else. I pray that you continue to guide and bless us in this project and that in the future, we can do many, many more. Um, thank you for the church for supporting us and please bless us. 
And even though we can't be together right now, um, we send our love and our um, warm hugs and um, encouraging words to everyone that's here and for those who couldn't make it. Um, whenever people see our talks or presentations, may they see you. And um, we do all of this to glorify your name as well. So be with us for the rest of the week and um, hopefully we can all make it again for our next talk on COVID-19 to be vaccinated or not. Thank you for all of this and um, thank you for your love. All this I pray in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Okay, I'll stop.